Um, hello, my name is Sally Noel. I'm a poultry extension specialist at the University of Minnesota. And uh, unfortunately, I can't be with you today, So, but I hope that you'll um, uh, enjoy the presentation and get some useful information out of it. And so the title of my talk is uh, Poultry Nutrition in 25 Minutes or Less. And that second part is actually more for me to make sure that I don't run over time and keep you from lunch. So we'll go ahead and get started here. So what I'd like to do is just to go through briefly uh, just a little bit about reminding people what nutrition actually is. And then we can talk a little bit about some in, nu nutrients and ingredients specific to poultry use. A little bit about feed preparation and labeling, how do we assure adequate nutrition, and then hopefully a couple of good take-home messages for you. So nutrition defined. I always start most of my nutrition classes with this. Um, it's the act or process of nourishing or being nourished, specifically the sum of the processes by which the animal or plant takes in and utilizes food substances. And so what you can see here where I've got the words highlighted anyways is that there's several things that go into nutrition um, and then the actual feeding part of it for an animal or plant or, or human. So if we kind of think about it and break it down for relative to poultry then, we kind of have the obvious where we have the feeder and we also have the feed in the feeder and, and birds will get to the feed that way. The not so obvious part of nutrition is what is the basis for formulation? How is the feed prepared? What kind of access does the bird have? Uh, what are the influences on intake? Uh, is the feed palatable or not? Uh, we also have seasonal or environmental impacts as well, particularly temperature that can feed back into the nutrient requirements and also intake as well. And it, you know, if we continued on talking about this, we could probably line up at least the same number of of things that we currently have listed on the on the screen there. So for nutrients, um, any of you that have um, looked at uh, nutrition at all and probably recognize most of these things are not, you know, they're similar across all uh, nutrient needs for all animals in that. Um, water is one that we do forget about. Uh, birds do need to have good uh, access to good quality water, uh, clean water as well. We also have protein that's used to build muscles, or in the case of, um, say, egg-laying chickens, you know, the proteins that are in the egg and the eggshell fiber. <clears throat> um, carbohydrates, broad classification here. Most of the time you might think of sugars, per se, and then fibers, but there's a lot of different uh, complexity in, in the types of molecules that form carbohydrates. We have the lipids, and that's just another name for fat, and those are very high-energy components, and there are also... Um, provide some essential fatty acids that are needed. And then we have the vitamins and minerals as well. And sometimes people will think of energy as being a, a nutrient, but it's really more a property of those things that are being provided in the feed. And, and typically the energy is going to come primarily from, from the lipids or the fat, the carbohydrates, and then the protein. If we just think a little bit comparative of birds to other animals, uh, typically their diets are going to be a higher nutrient density. Uh, they're not very good at digesting a lot of fiber, uh, so there's limitations there. They have a very specific vitamin D form that they need in their feed. Um, they also have very specific requirements for uh, essential amino acids and how those amino acids re relate to each other. And then another thing to keep in mind is that birds have a very rapid feed passage rate. So basically, if they eat a meal uh, within about four hours time period, at least 50% of that meal is going to have passed through the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so now if we get back to what's the basis for formulating feed, and if, uh, in terms of talking about poultry anyways, I'm just going to concentrate on maybe the main types that people might be raising. So we have we have chickens out there that are producing eggs for um, eating purposes, table eggs. Uh, we also have chick, uh, breeders in that that are going to be producing eggs for hatching purposes. We have meat type chickens, so the broiler type bird, uh, or Cornish cross. Then we have uh, various types of ducks and geese and then turkeys and game birds. And if you looked at diets and nutrient levels across all of those, you would see very striking differences in the types of uh, dietary protein content uh, energy, minerals, and vitamins that are being are being provided. Okay, 
Then we also, besides the type of poultry, we also need to consider the physiological state or productivity state of that bird. So age, um, you know, young birds are going to have very different requirements than older birds. How fast they're growing, if they're a slow-growing strain or a fast-growing strain, that's going to take an impact uh, what nutrient levels are required. If for reproduction, you know, egg production, hatching egg production, and that, that's going to influence it. And then kind of in between where the bird is mostly mature and it's kind of in a holding phase for, for various reasons. Okay, so for ingredients um, <clears throat> that might be present in a poultry feed, and, and this doesn't cover the whole gamut of what might actually, might actually be used depending upon where the feed is being produced and what ingredients are being used in that, but typically for sources of protein, we're going to have some soybean meal, uh, we may have some alternative protein sources like canola meal or dried distillers grains. Uh, there might be some animal protein or insect protein in there. I know the area of insect protein is, is growing fairly rapidly. So, uh, the DDGS, which is dried distillers grains with solubles, um, that's a byproduct of uh, corn that's being used for ethanol production. And so after the ethanol uh, has been uh, or after the corn has been fermented and the ethanol produced, there's material that remains, and that material is dried. And um, it's basically more of a highly concentrated source of corn protein if corn is the, um, the original input material. For energy, uh, we typically look at our grains for energies. And again, energy, so corn is actually a... Um, a grain that has a really high energy content in comparison to some of the grains. And then uh, fats and oils, so we could have, um, uh, for fats anyways, we could have animal fats that are coming in there for oils. We could have something like uh, canola oil or crude corn oil or something like that. And then minerals and vitamins, typically we get the majority of what's required in the diet from supplements. Um, because of the variability and the different ingredients and these contents in that, it's, it's less dependable. And so we prefer to take them and get some supplements that are going to take and provide that. <clears throat> so for minerals anyways, limestone usually provides the majority of the calcium. And then we also have phosphorus sources in there. And then for sodium or salt, um, sodium chloride, um, sodium is going to be provided by the salt. Trace minerals, because of the very small amounts that are typically used, you know, these will come as well as a supplement or premix um, and mix together. For vitamins, again, depending upon the season and the types of ingredients in that, we can get many vitamins from uh, the original ingredients or from birds foraging on, on different types of pastures in that. But to be sure that we've got enough of those vitamins present in that feed, uh, supplements are preferred. And here again, if you you know, if you looked at a jar of vitamins, the listing would be relatively the same. We have our fat-soluble vitamins, the vitamins A, D, E, and K, and then the B-complex vitamins. Okay, so sometimes we get questions about we don't want soybean meal in the diet. And depending upon the type of bird in that, it's very difficult in their protein requirements, it's very difficult to replace soybean meal totally in a diet. Um, Soybean meal has a lot of good properties to it, very high in protein content. It's a very good source of it, particularly one amino acid that's called lysine that tends to be the most limiting in a diet or most efficient in a diet. Um, but it is very difficult to replace it with other plant sources of protein. I'm going to switch over to a pointer here right now just to kind of be able to show you a few of the differences here. here. So we've got soybean meal. Uh, dried peas, canola meal, and then a grain source as an example. And we have um, the crude protein content here as a percent. So you can see soybean meal has the highest crude protein content. Peas is about half. Uh, canola meal tends probably to get the closest to the soybean uh, meal crude protein content, and there are some high protein varieties out there now. And then if we take a look at the example of wheat, um, you know, and typical of most grains anyways, that crude protein or protein content is going to be very low. And then if we look at that critical amino acid lysine, you can see that soybean meal is, is, is a very good protein source for being able to supply a lot of lysine. And then as we get to the grain sources, you, you can see here that there's very little uh, lysine being offered by, 
grain sources, particularly in this case, we're demonstrating wheat here. Uh, some of the other things that come into play is the presence of anti-nutritional factors. Uh, soybean meal and peas are legumes. Um, they have a lot of different proteins that can decrease digestibility of the feed, and so typically these need to be undergo some kind of heat treatment. But in particular for peas, it has a very poor amino acid profile. Canola, there's usually some concern with some off flavors if you get into some really high levels of supplementation of canola. And if we get back to some of the green, green sources like uh, wheat, it has a lot of fiber content, makes the diet very low energy. So, so with all of these, there are some restrictions in terms of how much of this material you can actually take and have um, in the diet. This, okay, so now we've had just a really brief um, introduction to um, you know, what we can see in the feed ingredients and what they're providing in that. And in order to build a diet from that, then we also need to know what are the requirements or what would be the recommended levels of these various nutrients in the diet. And so in this case here, uh, just showing for very young poultry, uh, there's a reference book called the NRC, 1994, and um, just showing you some of the information from that. And just to caution you, if you take this information and maybe look at a feed bag from your feed store or something, you might see some differences, in, and that's because as time goes on, there has been some changes in some of these requirements in that. So I do need to switch over to the pointer again. Okay, and so here we've got a crude protein um, requirement, which is actually more related to how well uh, the different amino acids in that can be provided from those uh, from that ingredient protein. But we have a broiler chicken here with a 23% uh, requirement. We have an egg layer chicken. They're much smaller. They grow at a lo uh, very low uh, rate of growth, so less protein needed. Here we have a, the turkey, uh, very high protein requirement. And then if we go over to another example of a game bird here for a pheasant, they also have a very high protein requirement. So oftentimes if you go to the feed store, you might actually pick up something that's a combination turkey, game, bird feed. Uh, calcium levels, very necessary for skeletal growth. And um, <clears throat> so you can see, I think the main thing I want to point out here is there's a fairly large variation in the amount of calcium uh, that would be needed in the diet. So we go from a low of 0.65 to a high of 1.2% for the turkey in a uh, young bird diet. Okay. So for feed manufacture then, um, if you're purchasing feed, it's basically with something that we would call a commercial complete feed. And complete feed means, just means that all the nutrients uh, that the bird is going to require is present in that feed, so you don't have to add anything to it or uh, mix it up with anything else. And that feed can be, um, can be provided uh, either in a ground form, which we call a mash, or you can take that mash that has been ground and have it um, steam pelletized, and then it can be provided as a, uh, a pellet. And for younger birds, those pellets will be broken up into something it, that we call a crumble. So we have a picture here of a mash and then a pelleted type diet. And getting back to some of the things we talked about before, a formulation is going to differ, again, depending upon the age and the sex of the bird. Um, as related to where it's at in terms of starting or whether it's going to be producing eggs, type of poultry, uh, level of productivity related to either growth or reproduction. Okay. Um, when you purchase um, feed from a uh, commercial product, uh, either in bags or as bulk, uh, there will be a label that's going to be associated with that. And basically, that's a, it's a label that's required uh, by law, and it will have um, basic, a basic feed product description and use. And then it gives more details about the product name, purpose, if there's any medications present. What, and an important one here is what's the intended use, um, what are the nutrient levels, ingredients, feeding directions, and then cautions and warnings come in here as well relative to particularly if there are any medications present and who the manufacturer was and what's the packaging weight. So just to give you an example, um, this is just an example feed label format uh, available on the web, but you know, it, you can tell very quickly 
that. It's for a turkey by the picture. The manufacturer's information is on here. This is just an example uh, for growing turkeys, uh, guaranteed analyses, the different types of ingredients. And then most important, importantly here, we have the feeding directions, which talks about this being a suitable diet to feed turkeys that are uh, uh, 16 or 16 weeks of age, I think is what that says. So ingredients listed start with the larger amounts that are present in, and then uh, finish with the smallest amounts that are, are present. So that goes in order. So typically you'll see, I think this says some grain products here, um, which you would expect it, you know, would probably be the majority of the material that's going to be present in this turkey feed for this age bird. Okay, uh, some of you may be preparing uh, feed in your own situation. One way of doing that, of course, you have to have some way of uh, being able to mix that feed, and there's a lot of, lot of different, I've seen a lot of different setups over the years that basically can accomplish uh, the main thing, depending upon the numbers of birds that you have, but you can purchase uh, what might be called a commercial concentrate, and it has the protein, vitamins, and minerals, and maybe some medications or something in there, and then you can um, mix that um, on site then with your, you know, with your a recommended ground grain. Usually, typically, that'll be corn. Uh, sometimes people are interested in trying to prepare their own feeds from scratch, and I put this in parentheses just to separate it from a term we're going to be talking about later on, which is scratch grain. But then you're going to need to have protein sources, and some of those, as I mentioned before, have to be have to be heated, dehulled, or ground. You'll have to have different types of uh, the mineral sources on hand. You'll have to have your trace minerals uh, premix and then vitamin uh, premix as well. And typically, these are a lot of times these premixes are sold in relatively large quantity sizes. And with vitamins, we do run into problems over time with stability of the vitamins in that premix um, under long-term storage. So it is fairly it is somewhat difficult, you know, to be able to pre prepare um, feed at home. If, and it's a little bit different, too, if you're talking about feeding a few birds versus uh, some relatively larger numbers of birds. Okay. Um, other supplements. So we can talk a little bit about grit. Um, and there are different kinds of grit, but typically for the kind of grit that we want that's going to sit in the gizzard, and help grind up the um, particles of uh, larger, coarser particles of feed that's present in the gizzard. We want something that's called insoluble grit and um, usually made from granite or marble. Uh, it's retained in the gizzard um, until it's eventually ground down. Uh, main things to remember here is to have the appropriate particle size for the size of the bird so you can get a chick grit or a hen grit. Um, <clears throat> and then availability. There's a, sometimes birds can take and overconsume on grit, and so it's kind of getting to know what kind of birds you have and offering the grit periodically to them. And then also they may not need to be supplemented as much, say if they're forag foraging or on pasture, but you'd still for sure want some grit available. Uh, what we find with grit anyways is it does help develop the gizzard, makes it a nice strong gizzard. Uh, for those of you that might be into processing, um, when you process the gizzard, the grit also helps in terms of being able to peel off that inner lining that's in the gizzard before you would take and, and eat it. Okay, other supplements. Sometimes people refer to oyster shell as grit, and it's really not a grit per se. What it is, and it's used for laying hands, is that it's a, a source of slowly digestible calcium to support eggshell formation overnight. So. It takes about 20 hours uh, in a day for eggshell to form, and birds aren't eating that entire 20 hours. And so by having an uh, oyster shell present, or at least some kind of large size um, limestone particle or something, it can take and, and provide um, calcium throughout the day. It's also retained in the gizzard until it slowly, um, it continues to decrease in time as the calcium is released. Then we have scratch grains, uh, corn, oats. Um, they can be a mixture of different types of grains and seeds in that. And people sometimes get a little bit 
carried away with feeding this, and birds actually like those scratch greens pretty good. And so um, it's good just to take and limit the feeding of those scratch greens to a relatively short time period, probably later in the day. Okay, uh, water-soluble vitamins and electrolytes. They can be very handy tools in, during periods, stressful periods, or where you might suspect that there might be a di diet shortage or a vitamin deficiency. Important to use according to label. Some vitamins can be very toxic if you provide an excess for those. And so again, following the directions is a good thing. And it's meant for short-term use. So, you know, two, three days maybe at the most uh, to get you through this time period. We also have medicated feed or uh, provision of drugs. Uh, you may go to a store and when you read the feed label, it will say it's medicated. Most of the times it's probably probably referring to the presence of something that's called a coccidiostat. And this is, um, um, a, can be, well, it's a medication that's used to help give the birds some protection against a parasitic disease called uh, coccidiosis. Uh, but it doesn't protect them totally because you do want some kind of exposure to allow development immunity to the coccidiosis over time. We still get back to talking about label, and so in these cases, particularly when, when we're talking about medicated feed or app, uh, provision of drugs and that, we want to be make sure that we're feeding and following those label directions and any associated veterinary feed directive that might be associated with a prescription for a particular type of feed. And typically, those cautions and warnings will be, you know, not to feed to other animals, and then again, for those that are um, producing eggs for human consumption, many medications are not allowed uh, in those diets when the hens are in egg production. Okay, so problems associated with poor nutrition then. You know, if you go to a book that talks about all the different things that uh, might impact um, bird performance and that and all these different, um, because of nutritional insufficiency in that, you would see, number one, that a lot of these might overlap. Um, and oftentimes we can't tell other than a nonspecific, say, decrease in performance or a little bit poorer health or something like that, what that's actually due to. And so that's when uh, you need to be very, or, you know, go check back with the feed manufacturer if you suspect a feed problem, uh, get some samples of feed, um, get, you know, depending upon what you're seeing anyways, you may want to get some analyses or or get birds to um, uh, a veterinary diagnostic lab where they can do some, some further testing for you. So if we think about protein anyways, and as I mentioned, it's very critical for muscle mass, um, uh, egg size, and that type of thing. So we're going to see things more like, you know, some effect on the growth, um, some effect on the, on the eggs in terms of numbers and size of that egg. Um, Feathers are composed primarily of a type of protein, and so we can get poor feather growth and poor feathering. Um, oftentimes, we'll get some feather picking if the birds are being fed a diet that's uh, deficient in protein because those feathers are high in protein, and so they will tend to, to go after the feathers. Uh, some of the more common things we might see relative to uh, minerals anyways would be an insufficiency of calcium, and that can cause something that's called rickets, which... It um, means that bones are not calcified um, to the extent that they should be, so it results in soft bones. And then you can also see a, a soft rubbery beak. And so in this case here, uh, this uh, turkey poult has uh, calcium deficiency or a vitamin D deficiency. The two are very closely related. And you can actually take and bend uh, that beak. With eggshells, with egg laying hens anyways, very quickly you can often tell, you know, calcium vitamin D deficiency just because of the importance of calcium deposition to take and form the egg shells. So the egg shells will get thin or, or there may not be any shell at all. Uh, sodium, uh, sometimes what we can see is, is some things on feather picking or a little bit more aggression. Um, and oftentimes this deficiency, once this behavior starts, it's very difficult to take and stop that. 
Okay. Insufficient um, vitamins, again, very, very similar to the list that we had before. I just wanted to make note here about decreased hatchability. So if you remember, if you're producing eggs um, for eating, uh, you may not have as many vitamins present in that egg or in that feed as compared to um, feeding breeders that are producing eggs for hatching. So we typically will go with much higher level of vitamin supplementation because the embryo needs access to uh, uh, more vitamins and minerals while it's developing. Insufficient energy. <clears throat> uh, really, it's if you feed diets that are very low and um, energy level, birds consume to try to meet their energy need, and so they'll take and increase their feed intake, um, which will result in what we call an increased feed conversion then. So if you look at the amount of feed, uh, amount of pounds of feed per pound of gain or, or per dozen of eggs, when they're inefficient, you're going to have to put a lot more feed uh, into that bird to get that level of productivity. And in some cases where the energy is very low, the bird itself may not even be able to consume enough feed physically. Um, and so um, they, they will not grow or produce as many eggs as you would like. Okay, so what are some of the feeding problems I've kind of, kind of seen over the past? Um, one is that basically providing the wrong type of feed product for a particular type of poultry. So... Um, as we mentioned, turkeys have a very high protein requirement, and so feeding them a starting meat-type chicken diet, they will do very poorly on that, as well as being the diet being deficient in calcium. Uh, likewise, feeding a meat-type chicken diet or a pullet diet to chicken layers, uh, the calcium levels are not going to be anywhere near uh, what that chicken layer is going to need to take and produce eggs. Other things uh, really come back to diluting a formulated complete feed. So, so the nutritionist at the feed company, they formulate this feed. It's got everything in there that, it, and that the bird is going to need. But then sometimes people will take and add grains to that product to you know, try to decrease, decrease the cost of feeding. Or they may offer too much scratch to the birds and the birds prefer to eat the scratch over the feed. Or if you've got birds that, um, you know, that you expect to do some foraging and gain some nutrition, um, sometimes uh, people go to excess in that and really expect the birds to get a lot more out of their foraging than they might, and so they're not getting enough, uh, enough food in that case. And some feeds are actually designed to maybe be diluted out in that, but that's where you really need to, again, check the feed label for that. Okay, other things, extended time of storage. So sometimes buying in bulk um, is good, but if you can't feed it out, say, within a, a couple month time period, particularly in the summertime, we worry about destruction of the vitamins, uh, oxidation in that, particularly with the uh, fat-soluble vitamins. And I forgot to put vitamin E should also be included in this list here. And any fats, fatty acids that are present in that feed will... Uh, tend to go rancid as well. Uh, other nutrients can be destroyed uh, during poor storage conditions. So, you know, having your feed in a, a tub sitting outside in the summer sun is going to quickly decrease its nutrient value. And then any kind of exposure to moisture, we have to worry about uh, mold growth occurring. Just a couple words here about um, actual feeding process. Um, I really, on a hanging feeder, I really like to have, have it set up such that the lip of the feeder is level with the wing shoulder. Sometimes people will actually adjust that up to the back of the bird. Um, wherever we're concerned about uh, potential feed, feed restriction, then we might want to think about lowering it a little bit. But this is what you see what happens when you have uh, a container that's sitting on the ground. Uh, the birds will come in and start to bill or uh, move that mash feed out of that uh, feeder. This section here is entirely filled up way too high, and so, you, and so you can see that there's just a lot of feed wastage that's going on here. But as I said, you have to be a little bit careful making sure that the access isn't too high because then, depending upon the height of the birds, they may not be able to eat. 
The other thing that I see sometimes is when you have feeders that are this low, you get a lot of bedding material in there. Uh, you may get some feces material in there or some moisture. The feed starts to kick up in that. And really, you know, it's not a good situation. So that material should be taken, removed out of there periodically. Okay. So we talked a lot more where we were concentrating on what might be deficiencies, uh, but we can also run into problems with excesses as well. So if we have excess salt or supplementation of sodium, uh, excesses of different electrolytes like potassium, um, that they can contribute to wet litter conditions or uh, wet, wet manure. Uh, if we have excess vitamin D or calcium present in the diet, that can lead to um, calcium deposits in the kidney and, and, and affect the bird's health. So uh, we also want to avoid nutrient excesses, and some of these nutri nutrients can also be very expensive to, to feed as well. So we don't want to go overboard there. Okay, so what I want, what I hope anyway, is that you would remember most about this presentation is that it did not hold up the serving of lunch, at least I hope it didn't. Um, that poultry are not all the same. You know, you really need to feed a diet for the specific type and, and type of production. Um, remember that complete feeds are formulating, assuming the product is to be used as described. So once you start to deviate, dilute, or feed outside of the label range, you could potentially run into uh, some feeding problems then. Uh, to me anyways, the most critical feeding phases are from hatch through brooding. So getting those birds started, making sure that they've got good feed intake, and then for um, reproduction anyways, for the breeders and the layer hens, uh, really getting them off to a good start and getting them through peak egg production will help maintain better performance later on. Mention about avoiding uh, providing too much of a good thing like scratch grains or vitamin supplements or electrolyte supplements. And then I hope you all have fun keeping your pro poultry healthy and, and well fed. For a very general source of information, at the e-extension website, there's a section on small and backyard flocks, and they have a lot of good articles on nutrition and feeding and, and many different things. So, thank you.